Welcome to It's a Rap with Rap. I am your host, Ron Rappaport. This podcast features people who do special things to enrich our lives and people who have overcome major challenges and adversities in their lives to come out on top. Our guest today is Sam, the miracle man, Shelley. Sam's life was filled with pain and suffering. From the age of six, a van nearly took his life. As an adult, he was hospitalized several times due to suicidal tendencies as a bipolar and then being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis that left him disabled. In addition, he had psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, and migraines. Now, one day, uh, things suddenly changed and his health was miraculously restored. This healing could not be explained by his doctors. He later learned that the medical community calls it a spontaneous healing. Over the course of 18 months, he made a full recovery from the traumas. Sam is no longer disabled and no longer needs medicine. Welcome, Sam, to the podcast. Hey, Ron, great to be with you today. Uh, Glad to have you. Uh, Let's dive right in. Uh, Can you take us back to your childhood years? Uh, What happened to you at age six with the van? And uh, how long were you hospitalized for? Yeah, so when I was six years old, it was the last day of first grade. And I, I you know I went home at the last day of first grade and I heard that familiar sound of the ice cream truck. So I bugged mom for some money for some ice cream. Well, then I got my ice cream. Then when I was going around the van to go back to my house, a van was speeding down the road and ran over me. So at that point, yeah, it was knocked unconscious, had head trauma, compound fracture in the left arm and a broken left hip. So I, I was out for a while. I was in the hospital for about a year and in recovery for several months after that. Wow. Uh, What were your your ensuing years like? Like, can you take us from say grade school up to high school? Yeah, so I really don't remember too much from like early grade school because of the head trauma and the other things. All I remember for, for sure was like, I left school at the end of first grade. I returned to school back in fourth grade. So you know, second and third grades were homeschooled or, or whatever. And then um, at fourth grade, after I completed fourth grade, my parents decided to move and I had to repeat fourth grade again in the school district. So that was kind of traumatic for me to repeat a grade because I just, my skills weren't up to par after I'm missing second and third grade. And then, um, you know, then the school years were pretty difficult because I was an undiagnosed bipolar going through school. So yeah. it was a very difficult time for me. So I went from this really quiet, quiet, shy kid to somebody that would just argue with the whole class over something trivial, unimportant stuff. Uh, what were your college and post-college years like? Well, let's see. Well, after high school, I couldn't see myself going to a four-year school. I just didn't have it in me, if you will. So I just went to a two-year school and got a degree in electronics because I was always you know, pretty much a loner for the most part, really introverted, really shy, keeping to myself. So I like to do those solitary activities. So I figured electronics was perfect, which got me into the computer field, which I did for about 20 plus years, then I left that. Now, when you were diagnosed uh, with, with a mental disorder, such as bipolar uh, depression, how did the doctors treat that? Well, the way they treated it was, you know, well, I was pretty much undiagnosed. So when I was suicidal in my 20s, first they, they diagnosed me with depression, but they gave me these pills which threw me into a mania. I finally saw a doctor at the, you know, down in Philadelphia teaching hospital, and he diagnosed me with bipolar, but I was a rapid cycle bipolar, which meant I went from mania to depression. And I usually went through those cycles a few times a day. So I could be really on top of the world and really at the bottom of the world within a, a few times in a day. So it took about five years to get the medicine, correct? Wow, five years. Yeah. How long did the, uh, the suicidal ideations go on for? And when you had them, did you actually have a plan? Oh, yeah. I, yeah, let's see. It, that went on for about five years. It took about five years to get the medicine correct where I didn't have those kind of thoughts. But yeah, I remember one time I definitely wrote the note, had the pills out and all that stuff. Okay. Did you confide in anybody about that? 
No, I was really a loner. Like I said, I really felt like a loner, even if I, you know, my girlfriend at the time was being my wife, you know, I really didn't confide in her either. I was pretty much isolated in my own little world wrapped gotcha. up in my uh, mental story. Gotcha. Now, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis are autoimmune diseases. Uh, how did the doctors explain uh, what was causing that? Well, yeah, they didn't really have an explanation for it. They just really just call it an autoimmune disease. And they, you know, they, they saw it with psoriasis. And that psoriasis, when it gets into the joints, is psoriatic arthritis. But for me, they, they really never figured out the root cause. Even like the, the bipolar, you know, my doctor never once said to me, do you know you all these thoughts you have, all these beliefs and opinions? They're not the truth. He just prescribed more medicine. So I saw him for like, you know, nearly 20 years. It was mostly medicine, but I never once suggested like yoga or meditation, something out of that mindset was always medicine. Yeah, it seems like they're always throwing pills at everything and yeah. they're just not getting down to the root causes. Right, they're not getting to the root cause. And this is where the autoimmune disease was. They weren't getting to the root cause. The root cause was I was completely stressed out and overwhelmed with life, extremely self-critical, extremely judgmental. So I was creating this really toxic inner environment where the body starts attacking itself from all right. the criticism, all the judgment, and all the stress was just manifesting on immune diseases. Yeah, and, and that makes absolute sense. Now, what age were you diagnosed with, with the MS and to what degree did you have it? Okay, so I also had migraines, you know, in my 20s. I had really severe migraines. So when I was 37 years old, I had the worst migraine of my life at my, my corporate job. And I just knew something was really wrong. So um, I had the worst migraine in my life, but I managed to get myself home uh, after that. But then I, um, you know, that night I was checked out of the hospital for stroke. Um, I, told, I told, my, talked to my neurologist for the migraines. I, so I saw him Monday morning, but Tuesday, I was, by Monday, Tuesday, I was barely able to walk. So I had the MRI Tuesday and by Wednesday I was in the hospital because I, I could not walk. So the wow. MS hit me really hard, which is really common for men. It hits them really hard, really suddenly. That's the way it usually is for men. So, so I was in the hospital for about three weeks, not knowing what was going on with me. Yeah. Because multiple sclerosis is a process of elimination. Oh, you don't have this. You don't have this. You don't have this. So the, the, after three weeks, they concluded from three tests, you know, MRI, if a potential and spinal tap that it was MS. And, and how did they, how did they treat your MS? Uh, medicine. Yeah. So just, just more pills. So by time I was diagnosed with MS, I was taking 13 daily medications, an injection for the MS, needed the cane, you know, cooling vest, all sorts of aids just to uh, survive. Well, that answers my next question, 13 daily medications. I wanted to know how many medications you were on. Uh, what prompted uh, uh, you to discover and practice meditation and how uh, did you meditate? Yeah, because the thing is, I was never a spiritual person. I was always in the corporate mindset. It was always black and white. I had to see it to believe it kind of mentality. But when I was diagnosed with MS, I really had a lot of fatigue, a lot of the issues. So I was really a couch potato. So I was always watching a lot of TV shows, everything and anything on TV. I used to watch ghost hunting shows, but I didn't know if it was real or fake. To me, it was TV, it was entertainment. Right. But then I saw a tweet from a ghost hunter. Hey, we're having this event down at Fort Mifflin in Philadelphia. I'm like, well, I can go to that for about an hour or so before the fatigue really kicked in. So I got a hotel by the... By the day of the event, I got a hotel nearby and I went to this event. Um, so at the time, it was really an adventure for me to travel. I had a freezer for my cooling packs and my cane. All my medicine it was always an adventure going <laughs> anyplace. Yeah, I can imagine. So, um, yeah, at this event, well, I, first of all, I did my research and see what was the most active, supposedly active area of the fort. The fort Mifflin was used during the Revolutionary War and during the Civil War. So it was always... Um, let me just get rid of this distractions. Um, okay, yeah, so it was just always, um, you know, just wondering, you know, so I was at this event 
And at this event, I went to the casemates, which was used as a prison for the, uh, civil, during the Civil War time. So I was sitting in one of the casemates for about 15, 20 minutes. Nothing was happening. It was very boring, if you will. But it was, um, then somebody put out a flashlight and they said, turn this flashlight on. It went on, turn this flashlight off. It went off. I thought it was really curious. So I put out my flashlight and it did the same thing. I'm like, okay. So, so there is something here because I was a skeptic. It, it wasn't my flashlight. Now my flashlight was doing the same thing. Yeah. So there's something was there. Then, then after that, it felt like somebody sat next to me. I couldn't see. I just felt like somebody sitting next to me on the bench and the casemates. Then I just felt this overwhelming sense of dread. So that was so after 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 that, the group went to another area. We went to this other area. Nothing was really happening. I was getting tired, fatigued. My cooling vest was melting. So I just left at that point. But I was very curious about what happened that night with, with the flashlights and somebody next to me I couldn't see. So I was like, okay, so ghost hunting is real, I guess. So what is this experience? So I was like, okay, so what, what, where can I learn more about this? So I started to read a book from a medium. You know, mediums talk to dead people. Yeah, so, yeah. So I read this book from a medium and they talked about one of the things they used to get into the space was meditation. And they started describing the benefits of meditation and one of the benefits was inner peace. I'm like, ah, I need inner peace. I'm so yeah. stressed out, so overwhelmed with life. I need inner peace. After all you've been through, you do need inner peace. That's that's it for sure. Yeah, so I needed inner peace. So I had no concept of healing. There was no really in, any instructions on how to meditate. It was really like a page and a half or two pages yeah. on meditation in this whole book. But that was enough for me. I was like, all right, meditation brings inner peace. I need this. So I began that night with a five minute practice, but I was under the impression that meditation meant, meant you stop thinking. So for the first two weeks, I would sit there for five minutes and tell the mind to stop thinking, stop thinking, stop thinking. Mm -hmm. Then I realized it was a thought chasing a thought. Then I realized, wait a second, I have thoughts, but I'm not my thoughts. That was the first prevalent realization that I was not my thoughts. So the next question that came up for me, well, if I'm not my thoughts, then who am I? So I got my answer about three months later. So I was still sitting for five minutes a day after that, five minutes twice a day by the second month. And by the third month, I was sitting 10 minutes twice a day. Basically, when the mind got thinking, I would be like, okay, where are my feet? Where are my hands? Where's, where, where's my breath? Thinking, come back to the moment. Thinking, come back to my sensations. And that was my practice. So after the third, after one evening, after my 10 minute practice, I was just sitting there and I heard either a voice or a strong thought say perfect spirit. I'm like, that's it. That's who I am. I'm perfect spirit. Ron, you're perfect spirit. Everyone listening is perfect spirit. But we get lost in this mind filled with all this garbage that I call head trash that we forget who we are. Right. So when I, when I knew that I was perfect spirit, I just had a deep, deep sense that all is well. All kind of concern I had about my health was simply gone. I just had this deep sense that all is well. And that night I began to taper my medicine. I just had the knowing that it's time to, to start taper off this stuff. So 16 months later, after hearing Perfect Spirit, I was taking no more medicine, needed no cane, had no signs of disease. I was simply following my own intuitive voice, my own instincts. So the Perfect Spirit that you, you, you found it just, just through meditation. Yeah, just hearing those words, perfect spirit, or that thought, perfect spirit, that intuitive voice, say perfect spirit. And the mind got very quiet after that. Like somebody took a broom to the head trash and swept it all out. So over uh, what period of time uh, did you discontinue all your medications? And what was the withdrawal like? I don't know where, if you were on benzodiazepines or anything oh, like that. Oh, that was that. That was the absolute worst. Drug right, I would have, yeah, I, I know that that's like the worst. Yeah, that was the absolute worst. That's the only medicine that I worked with, with a doctor to get it off. Of. I was like, I just can't seem to get off this. So this doctor, my rheumatologist, he gave me advice to get off this medicine. He was the only supportive doctor. The rest of them had no clue why I was getting off the medicine. He was the only one that was supportive. So wow. he, he gave me a, he gave me tips to get off the benzo, and I did that. But then um, the universe works in strange ways. When it was time to get off my, um, my daily injectable for MS, 
uh, there's just a lot of resistance with my, within myself. But there's this rare side effect that happens with this medication. And I never experienced it. But when it was time to get off that medicine, I was getting that side effect every day for five straight days. I'm like, I need to stop this. It's obvious I don't need this anymore. What so was I, that? What was that side effect? It was like um, rapid heartbeat, like tightness of chest. That's, that's a sensation getting like tightness of chest, really rapid heartbeat. So I was getting that for like five straight days and like that. And now I can't do this anymore. Yeah, that must so, have been awfully scary. Yeah, so it was like, um, all right, I get, I get it. I'm not supposed to be on this medicine anymore. So that was that. So I stopped taking medicine and about nine years now I've been off medicine. No, no problems. No That's issues. great. That's great. Uh, when did the, uh, the suicidal ideations fade away? Well, once I was stable with the medicine, that, that pretty much wasn't an issue. But one thing it did, st I, I wasn't, I don't know if it was, I was just extremely depressed when I was given the MS diagnosis, like my bipolar become, became unstable at that time. But they did give me some additional medicine to help with that. Um, because the way I was diagnosed with MS was really unusual. It was basically a, a visiting doctor just on a weekend, like a fill-in doctor. Yeah. He just basically walked in one day and said, uh, well, he's one of his daily rounds, like, oh, we concluded you have MS and promptly walked out. We basically said, oh, we determined you have MS, you'll be okay. And he just left the room. Wow. <laughs> I'm glad you don't, I, I'm glad right now you don't have to deal with any more of those doctors. Who, who dubbed you uh, the miracle man? Well, it was after I wrote the first book, one of the book reviewers on Amazon called yeah. me the miracle man and yeah. it stuck. Yeah, I like that. Sam the Miracle Man. It's got a good ring to it. What was your family support like uh, during the MS period? And tell us about uh, your married life at that time and how all that was. Affected. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, so from, from my family, that my mom was supportive, and my father was supportive, but my wife wasn't too supportive at that time. You know, like I was in the hospital, you know, for MS for three weeks then in rehab for another month. I told her all these kinds of things, I, all these disability aids I need at the house so I can come home. So after I you know, check out of the hospital, she has me running around to all the stores getting my disability aids. I'm like, why didn't you do this beforehand? You know, it's, it's summer, I don't do well in heat. Um, this makes yeah. no sense, she's, she's dragging me around. And her thing was like, I didn't want to buy the wrong things. And it wasn't that, she just wanted, that wasn't supportive. And yeah, you know, like when I was in the teaching hospital in Philadelphia for three weeks, I didn't see her very often. She didn't come down too often. I found, I later discovered, which ended the marriage, you know, that instead of seeing me, she was out on dates. Yeah. Well, can you tell us uh, what was the physical trans transformation of your body like? I mean, when you were going from all these medicines and everything to back to what we'll call normal. Uh, what was it like going through that for your body? Oh uh, yeah, it, it was. It still feels a little surreal for me because I basically had an injured, damaged body from the age six to the age forty-four. Yeah. So it still feels like I didn't have a healthy body for for that long. It still feels like surreal that I don't need a cane today. I don't need medicine. I don't need anything. So it's a little surreal today that you know my transformation. Did uh, did religion or spirituality play any part in this at all? Well, I had no spiritual teachers when I was going through this journey. I was really just following my own intuition, my own insights. Out of curiosity, I was you know starting to go into some metaphysical groups and things like that, but that was I didn't really have any like guru or anyone that I followed. It was really my my own instincts. And then after I healed, then I started to read the spiritual books and try to understand what I went through. What prompted you uh, in 2014 to write the book, I Don't Dwell, and tell us uh, a little about the book? Yeah, so basically it was, well, I wrote the book in 2013. It was published in 2014. But the, it really came about the book was, everybody was asking me, how did you do this? How did you do this? Yeah. So I decided to lay out in the book of how I did this. And actually, you know, I actually shopped it around and got a traditional book contract for that. 
So the publisher went out of business. So now I just give the PDF of the book away. I just give that book away now so people can just see the steps that I did. And it was extremely simple, my five minute practice. And then the next book that I have an idea that I start to write a little bit was the five minute cure. That's really what it was, you know, very simple practice. So I'm either in the mind or here in this moment. Now, what was the reaction of the physicians treating you after you stopped uh, all of your medications? And what were your, uh, your labs and your MRIs? What, did, what were they like? Yeah, so the last appointment that I had, because I, I was dropping all my doctors as I was getting off the medicine because they weren't supportive of my journey going off medicine, except my rheumatologist. He was, he was the only one that really helped me with that, but I kept my neurologist appointment. You know, I just wanted to be curious to see what my neurologist would have to say. So I, I saw him, I guess, um, two, three months after I stopped all, all, all my medicine and things like that, and he was really puzzled. He's questioning me for 45 minutes trying to quantify what I did. He's like, yeah. your scans are clear. Your blood, blood work is better than my blood work. The only <laughs> thing wrong I see with you is a nonspecific hand tremor that everyone has. And he just started to grill me with all kinds of questions trying to understand it. And he couldn't figure it out. It wasn't until I saw Dr. Gabor Mate at a conference in California who, um, you know, he's a pretty famous doctor who goes around talking about mindset and how it impacts the body. Well, he basically asked me some questions to figure out what I was doing. And he just looked at me and said, oh, you stopped believing your mind. Wow. Wow. Now you conduct uh, healing through mindset mentoring. What type of issues uh, do you counsel your patient, your, your patients or your clients about? Yeah, what I'm really trying to do is, is that I'm not healing them. I'm basically trying to awaken their own inner healer, trying to get them to remember who they are, clearing out their own head trash, their own stories, getting rid of those labels, the opinions they have of themselves, the beliefs, and really tap into who they truly are, perfect spirit, consciousness, and allow that own intuitive voice to rise up. So, and sometimes I do step in a little bit, like, um, the best example I can share this, uh, a friend of a friend called me and said, I know somebody that is in the hospital with cancer. So she really, so, you know, stage, stage four cancer that metastasized through the body. So I went into the hospital room and she was in really bad shape. I was just looking at her and like, she only has days left to live. She was in really terrible shape. So I, I worked with her for 90 minutes. We did one 90 minute session and then I'm, um, then she went home a few months later. Wow. And, uh, yeah, she, she got out of the wheelchair, so I had to resume her life. I mean, she was still battling cancer for another five years until she passed. But she had another five years to have those milestones with her family. That's, that's unbelievable. Listen, you, you, you've been throwing out that word, uh, head trash. And I know what it, I know what you're talking about, but I don't, for the audience, can you, can you explain that? Yeah. So head trash is basically, it's taking you anything out of this moment. So it's all the stress, it's anxiety, it's the worry. It's all the stories that we're not good enough. We don't measure up. We don't have the skills. We're not the right age. It's all of those nonsense that we have in our head. That's really garbage. So before, you know, my first book was I Don't Dwell, like, like not stop dwelling in thoughts. I'm like, well, that doesn't really connect with people. If I call it garbage, head trash, you can see that you can throw that stuff out. You don't have to be stuck with it. You can, you can throw it out like the garbage. You can just toss it out five minutes a day. Now, what kind of uh, successes uh, do you have counseling your clients? It's, it's really like, it's it's miraculous the things that I'm seeing. It doesn't explain any any rules that people have really shifted their lives when they get rid of that head trash and really tap into who they are from from things like cancer to you know things like social anxiety. All those kind of things are that there's no limitations. All the limitations are just strictly in the mind. It's really remarkable people that are in sessions with me. Because one of the indicators that I see in my sessions when I'm doing like Zoom, I can see their face because I can't do a person now. But typically they'll be like sad, 
feeling very heavy, like depressed, that you know, things aren't going well in their life. And after each session, they just feel deep peace and they're just smiling. So Sam, what knowledge can you impart to our audience about finding their perfect spirit and leading more happy lives and getting rid of that head trash? Well, it's, it's really simple. You have to realize if you're in the head trash, you're in the story, you're wrapped up in the mind. So if you're wrapped in the mind, you're either thinking about the past or guessing what the future may be. But we have to realize that all of our power is right here in this moment. So realize when you say, where are my feet? You're going to be focused on your feet. You're not going to be focused on the story. That's basically my practice. There goes the mind thinking again, creating these stories, bringing me out of this moment and into you know, a place of disempowerment. When you're not here in this moment, you're in a disempowered state. So it's really coming back into this moment, like Eckhart Tolle talks about, you know, the power of now and Ram Dass in the 60s talking about the present moment. Like everyone has talked about this, be in the present moment. And that's where all your power is. And once the head trash is cleared out, then you can hear your own insights, your own wisdom that is here in this moment. That's always there whispering to you. It was, we just can't hear because the mind is so noisy so distracting we can't hear our own wisdom that people know what people know that they know what to do for them but they forget to get lost in the head trash so i'm really there to help them remind them who they are outside of their stories okay so for the lay person i would say thinking about the future thinking about the past that's kind of like what you're talking about right yeah yeah, it's a head trash. It's a disempowered state because the past is long gone. The future is not here. All we know for certain is right here, right now. Anything else is just guessing, but we don't really know. And we sometimes people have these big goals. And then when that moment actually arrives to that goal, and if there's a mismatch, then you get all sorts of stress, anxiety. And that's not healthy. It's really about, you know, getting rid of the stress and worry and the anxiety so the body can start coming back into homeostasis, back into harmony. And I would imagine if one goes into that meditation state where they get rid of all that head trash and they take a look around, they're probably looking at things they've never seen before, you know, Absolutely. on their surroundings. Is that, is that right? Yeah, because they actually done a study on this and it might not. And so, and I do want people not to be so focused on meditation. I felt I found many people that meditate that are angry and really upset with the world because they haven't really dealt with their head trash. It's really being about mindful, being mindful throughout the day when you're interacting with people, not getting hooked into the story, but remembering yourself here in this moment. Um, but that's the thing is they've done a study that people that are here in this moment experience the present moment three times longer. So wow. time slows down. Could you say that again? They, they say that again? They've they, they done a study on this up in Toronto, the University of Toronto. People that meditate or that here are, are really fully here in this moment experience the present moment three times longer. Wow. Time seems to slow down for them. Wow. Can you tell us about your website? Yeah, so my website is headtrashanonymous.org. Okay. Yeah, so anonymous.org. Yeah. Okay. And then you can find me on, you know, YouTube as Sam the Miracle Man. Um, and then are there on YouTube on sharing, sharing daily videos on YouTube. And then uh, if people want, want even shorter videos, they can see me on TikTok. And I've been doing daily videos there for about two, three weeks now. So I do these 15 second, 30 second TikToks of just a daily wisdom nugget, if you will, just some insights. But then I dive into deeper topics on, you know, on uh, the YouTube, including some meditations to clear out the head trash. Because once you clear out the head trash, then, you know, you're, you're unstoppable. Yeah. I'm going to try it right after this. <laughs> uh, do you have an email or is it just everything off the website? Yeah, they can email me at sam at headtrashanonymous.org. They can reach me there. But and, and then also on one Facebook, if they're on Facebook, I think go Head Trash Anonymous Global Chapter. If they go to my Head Trash group on Facebook, they can get a copy of my first book, the PDF of I Don't Dwell. 
I just give that away in that group. They can just see the files and download it. No emails required or anything. I just want to freely give it out there, give that wisdom out there. That, and people have read that book and cleared their social anxiety. I have a really nice testimonial. Somebody read the book. They were unable to work because the social anxiety was so bad. After yeah. reading that book and doing the steps, and now they're back in the workforce. Well, it was certainly uh, an interesting talk. Uh, I will include all the links in the podcast notes. Uh, I would like to encourage our listeners to contact the podcast with any comments, suggestions. Our email is it's a wrap with wrap at gmail.com. Our podcast is now on the HC Universal Network of Podcasts. Please check out our website at hcuniversalnetwork.com for all of our episodes and other great podcasts. Our website is it's a wrap with rap.com. We're on Facebook, it's a wrap with rap. Thanks everyone for listening. I want you to stay safe. And for now, it's a wrap. <laughs>